So, um, it seems as though that the young preacher said to the old man, said, do you think God preaches? Only two of us here. And he said, well, it's like this. When I go to the barn to feed the cows, if all of them don't come in, I feed the ones that come in. So the young preacher took the hint, got up, and he preached, and he preached, <laughs> and he preached. And finally when he quit, he turned to the old fellow and said, well, what did you think of my preaching? He said, well, son, it's like this. When I go out to feed the cows at the barn and only a few of them come in, I feed them. But I don't feed them enough for the whole herd. <laughs> so I'm going to trim this off to the first page of our notes off today, tonight and think mostly of the pitiful picture that Jesus painted of the scribes, the Pharisees, and his relatives. His immediate family, as a matter of fact, in the latter part of this chapter. Because we start thinking about Jesus as he says that uh, beginning with verse 43, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it, underline that word, empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with him Self, seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. the first. Even so shall it be also under this wicked generation. That's the first lesson for the night. Second, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother, and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my mother, my brother, and sister, and mother. Amen. Actually, Jesus sort of summarized the entire chapter 5 in this particular lesson. For if you'll note, Jesus commended these scribes and Pharisees. He bragged on them. You wouldn't think that. Most time you think of Jesus as being one who condemns the scribes and Pharisees. But if you turn in your Bibles to chapter 23, verses 2 and 3, there, and by the way, this is on your notes. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe. Now notice. Scribes and Pharisees said in most, that is, they are interpreters of the Mosaic Law. And Jesus said, all that they teach you from the Mosaic Law, that observe and do. Because our obligation is to follow the teachings of the law. As we say many times, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my path and a light unto my uh, walk. So the Lord's word is that which is our guide. It is that which is embedded in our hearts and in our consciences and teaches us how we ought to live worthily before him. But the last part of that verse, Jesus said, But do not ye enter their works. Now there's a condemnation part. For they say, and do not. 
It was at this point I thought that I might delve just a little bit into a contrast between basic beliefs among Christians. Some are monitors, monogerists, and others are, are another word here I've got a big, I don't have to read myself, synergism. There's monogerism and synergism. I'm not going to deal with those. Except that one believes in monogerism, and the word essentially means walk alone. Believe that God, in His infinite wisdom and love, works in our lives. And while we think that we're doing something for Him, we aren't. He's in, given us the impetus to do it, and the mind and the will to do. The synergists believe that man cooperates with God. And that uh, that means to walk along with. So we believe that God walks along with us. Where the monogists would say that God would be robbed of his glory if man had to do anything toward his salvation and toward the life that he lives, then it would destroy the, would affect the glory of God. Whereas the synergists would say it's the glory of God to have created a man in his own image and give him the opportunity and the will to obey him because they want to, because they desire to, because they love to, not just because there's something on the inside that's making them do it. Well, the big difference is this. One would have their hand in the air and the puppets would be on the floor and they would be making the puppets move. The other one would be giving energy to the other and, and giving them the impression within their heart of the Holy Spirit to move and please the Lord. Which do you think would please God more? Puppets in His hand or people of their own will wanting to serve the Lord? That's the big difference between the monogerism and the synergism. In this lesson, you can almost see the devil. Do you get what I mean? You, go, you can't uncap the walls of hell and look on the inside and see the horribleness of people as they're crying. As the 16th chapter of the book of Luke shows us, a man who cries, Abraham, send Lazarus to cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. You can't see those in which the, the Apostle Paul said the Lord was going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. But you know what? You can walk down the street and you can see the devil in all of his glory with his horns pointed up and a long spiked tail in his red suit in all of his ugliness. You can see him. In this chapter you see Jesus. And the scribes and Pharisees, because it's a very devil out of hell that rises up in their hearts and says, you shouldn't be eating on the Sabbath day. And what they're doing, they had no compassion. Mm -hmm. Show me someone who professes to be a Christian and has no compassion within their heart. No compassion for those that are hungry. No compassion for those that are sick. No compassion for those who have a withered hand. No compassion for those who are demon-possessed. No compassion for those who out of their heart are doing the right thing. But out of the well springs of the heart the volcanic lava is seething upward from their heart and spewing out from their lives and the very empty of hell. You can see them in their works and in their attitude and in their hearts and in their lives. And Jesus described that. The tree is known by its fruit. Out of the heart, the man speaketh. And in this lesson, Jesus is saying that the devil left a man. <clears throat> he left a man. And when he left the man, he went out in dry places. And finding none, he returned. And when he returned, he found the house that was swept, garnished, and empty. That's the sad part. Empty religion will make empty churches. 
Amen. We'll make empty lives, empty hearts, empty compassion, empty love, empty desire to please God, emptiness in your entertainment, empty in all of your aspects of your life. And Jesus was saying that what has happened to scribes and Pharisees in their harping and, and grouching and complaining and nitpicking. They were people that the devil had gone out and they were cleansed by the law of Moses. But after they found the cleansing by the law of Moses, their heart was empty and something comes in. You don't have a void. Nature doesn't like empty, and a life is not empty. You will do something. Idings Bell, a Roman Catholic uh, priest said in his writings, man will worship something. You will either worship God, and you will serve Jesus Christ, or you will worship your house, you will worship your car, you will worship your television, you worship your entertainment. You worship your family. You worship your job. You worship your beauty. And all of it is fading and passing. Amen. And we're headed as fast as the unlocked wheels of time will let us roll toward eternal judgment when we stand before the Lord Amen. to give an account of the deeds that we've done in the body. That's what Jesus meant. The house was cleaned and it was empty. And instead of being empty, the devil came back and with all of his demons, they moved in with seven worse. And the last day of that man was worse than the first. How sad. How sad. I've seen many people start and stop. And I've seen many people make shipwreck of their faith. I've seen preachers ended up in prison. I've seen preachers ended up with broken families. I've seen preachers who had great desire to let the boat on the, on the lake, let the car on the highway, the sceneries and the sights of life to take away their desire to serve Christ. Right. Lost their compassion for lost and dying souls. Lost the vision of heaven as a home. And lost the fear of God and turn toward their devilish ways and their end be worse than their first. That's what Jesus said. And that's exactly what this lesson is pointing out. There's a second lesson we note here tonight. And this is found from the words that Jesus gave, I believe, in the book of Mark. He said that a man prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. Listen to this if we read it again. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. If you would underline, stand without. That's the sad part of this lesson. Because if the scriptures, the harmonizing of the scriptures show anything, it shows that those who knew Jesus best doubted him. Listen. For neither did his brethren believe in him. John 7, 5. They were getting ready to go up to the temple to worship. And they were encouraging Jesus, go along with us and show people some of your works, so that they will believe. And then the scripture just sneaked in that little thought, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Who were his brethren? Well, in Mark and in Matthew, Mark's chapter 6, Matthew chapter 13, it gives you a list of who his brethren were. There was James, and there was Joseph, or Joseph, same person, just named different name and different uh, renditions of the scriptures. And there was Judas, also known as Jude. And then there was Simon. And plus there were unnamed sisters. So Jesus' mother, four brothers, maybe some of the sisters, were standing without. If that doesn't break your heart, 
when I think of Mary and the Annunciation, and the angel appearing to her and saying, Hail Mary, thou art favored among women. The Holy Ghost is going to come over you, and you're going to bear a child. And that child is going to be the Savior of the world, so to speak. And then, when she says, Let it be unto me, even as you have said, Joseph, her husband, was minded to put her away. And he had a dream in which the angel appeared to him and said, Fear not to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife, for that holy thing which shall be born of her shall be none other than Christ the Lord. And then, after carrying this child for nine months, she, in between times she went down to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was carrying John the Baptist, and just the sound of her voice that John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb. Mary went out saying what is called the Magnified. She praised God for what God was doing in her life. But not only did Mary know that, but when she had that child, though it might have been wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger in either a cave or a barn because there's no room in the inn, all heaven broke loose. And the angels stepped down from glory and told the shepherds that a peace on earth, good will toward men. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. They came to see him, and when they saw him, they returned rejoicing. They fortified Mary's faith in what she had gone through. And then shepherds who came following a star went to Herod to find the place where he lay, probably a year, two years later. But they finally wended their way into the place where Jesus was. And they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they departed in another way. The angel in heaven spoke to Joseph and said, Joseph, trouble brewing, go down to Egypt. And Herod killed the children who probably were 18 months or, or maybe two, three years old hoping that he would kill a possible rival for the throne. He went miraculously, and God appeared to him again with an angel and told him when to go back, and he settled in Nazareth. And there Jesus grew up. Luke tells us that when Jesus was about 12, that mother and father took him along to the temple. And when he got to the temple, Jesus became so enamored talking with the doctors the scribes, the Pharisees, and the doctors and lawyers of the law. They were amazed at the teaching of Jesus. And Joseph and Mary went on and left Jesus behind. And when he came back looking for him, Mary said to him, Wish ye not? The Lord said, Don't you know that we're worried about you? And Jesus said, Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? The Bible says he grew in favor with God and with man. Man. They knew that. Mary knew that. How could she have doubted the wonders that Jesus was doing? Remember, we're told in the second chapter of the book of John that Jesus was there at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. His mother came to him and told him they don't have any wine. They run out. She was insinuating, work a miracle. Jesus said, my time has not yet come. But he said, tell them, bring some kegs of water. And Jesus said, or Mary said to the servants who brought the water, said, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And they brought the wine, Jesus, or the water, and Jesus turns it into wine. She knew that. Yeah. Don't you think by that time her brothers had been born into the family? And they knew that. Don't you think his sisters were there? They knew that. Of course. They had to know. But there they were standing on the outside with questions, with doubts. Paul even said that James was the Lord's brother. He referred to him in Galatians 1 and 20, 19. And I want to ask a question today. What happened to this family? I believe it happened at the cross. I believe Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They began to see that Jesus truly was more 
than just a son, then he was the son of God. Yes. And they began to see the miracles as they tested and witnessed to the fact that Jesus was the very son of God. And at the cross, yes, at the cross, Jesus looked down and he saw Mary, spoke to John, said, Behold thy mother. Mother, behold thy son. Mary's heart was ripped out. And even as the prophet said, a spear had been driven through her very heart and her soul as she saw her son hanging there, dying for the sins of the world. But not only that, later you find that the brothers have now become believers. Who do you think wrote the book of James? James, the brother of Jesus. Who do you think wrote the book of Jude? Probably Joseph, or the one who called Judas, the brother of Jesus. Amen. They now are convinced, and James becomes one of the leaders in the church at Jerusalem. So here we have these brothers as they're turning back and recognize that Jesus is Lord and God. But Jesus looked down that day and I'll say he had said it with all pity in his heart for them, but in love for those who loved him. Those who stayed with him. Those who stayed the course. Those who were going out and casting out devils and demons and healing the sick and come back and rejoicing because they were even subject to the name of Jesus. Jesus said, rejoice not because of this, but rather rejoice because your names are in heaven. And he raised his hand. You know, read too many times Jesus raising his hand like that. And he waved over his disciples. And he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And he answered them. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my mother, and my brother, and my sister. Some of these days, we're going to stand before him in glory. Amen. And when we stand before him, he separated the sheep from the goats, and he turned to the sheep that are on the right side. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Let's be true. Let's be faithful. Let's serve the Lord because we love Him. And let's not give the devil a place in our hearts. James said, if we would flee from if we would stand up to the devil, he'll flee from us. Amen. This is one thing you want to remember. It's so easy to let your ignorance destroy your faith. Peter tells us that this they willingly are ignorant of. Doesn't mean they don't know any better. They're willing ignorant. Don't let willing ignorance destroy your life. Don't let the devil move in. Put him on the run. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for these two lessons, and pray that thou would bless them to our heart and help us to take warning and to love you and to serve you because we want to. Yes. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.